It's great seeing everyone here, and I feel like I've been gone forever. I honestly feel like it's been a long time since I've been uh, up at the platform, and some of you are like, I didn't even know you left, and that hurts. That hurts me. Um, I uh, just came back. Uh, We were away, uh, and I uh, performed Pastor Mike's daughter Carolyn's wedding. And I know uh, you have probably heard him mention that a couple weeks before, but it was awesome. Uh, we all went on a cruise, this whole family, uh, her husband's family, and uh, me and my wife and my kids, we all went on this cruise together, and it was just the best. It was like the best time, and uh, everything was beautiful. We did the wedding on one of the islands, and I think probably next week, Pastor Mike will show you uh, some of the pictures, but it was on St. Lucia. And uh, it was, uh, everyone kept saying how beautiful everything looked and how great it looked. And I'm like, thanks, this is a nice suit. I had a nice suit on. No one really cared what I looked like. But it was, it was a really, really uh, beautiful bride, beautiful wedding, awesome family. And I'm glad to be back in the swing of things. Now, we're starting a new series today. It's a two-part series about Christmas called Expect the Unexpected. And I was thinking about it because I just did a lot of traveling um, about maybe six years ago, seven years ago, Jamie and I were coming back uh, from vacation somewhere. And did you ever stop at a, uh, were, were you ever traveling on the turnpike and you have to stop and get gas and you take one of the exits and the sign says gas next exit, but you have to go like a hundred miles to get the gas. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you need gas before you go to get the gas at the gas station. Okay. It was like one of those ones we were driving, we were driving away from civilization, away from house and then it was just empty, empty, and I'm getting nervous. And I'm like, I don't want to keep driving. But finally, the gas station just seemed to appear out of nowhere. I mean, there was nothing. There was no uh, houses. There were no other cars. It was barren. And so we get out, and of course, they have seven gas pumps, and six of them are out of order. Okay, so that's always a good sign, all right? So uh, I go to pump the gas, and it's just got a, a switch that you turn on or off. And there was no, I was looking for a place to put the credit card um, thing, and there was no credit card thing. So I went inside, and I said, I was looking for where the credit card slot is. She's like, oh, yeah, we haven't gotten around. We're going to get those pretty soon. I'm like, get those pretty soon. I'm like, you're about 20 years late. It's like the technology of the 90s, you know? And so uh, we were talking and she was processing the uh, order. And I said, so what do you like to do around here? Like, what do you enjoy doing around here with your free time? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, in this town, like you live here, like what do you do around here? She's like, I I work for the gas station. (laughs) And I said, this conversation's going so well, going really good. But there really wasn't much to do around there. And when we got in the car, you know, just as I was leaving, I was thinking, do you ever go somewhere and you thank God that God didn't make you be born in that town? Okay? And I'm not saying it was bad. I'm sure the people that are like it, but I'm like, I like living in Pittsburgh. I like living in a city. But that's a town that I'm like, I'm glad I'm not there. Well, that, believe it or not, is the type of town that Nazareth was. Nazareth. The center of one of the parts of the Christmas story, a big part, Nazareth. Now, you hear Nazareth, you're Jesus of Nazareth and where he lived and all that stuff, but you don't know Nazareth was a very poor town. It was very poor, and it was a small town. You would blink if you passed through it. There's like a a conceptualization of what it might have looked like, but most conservative archaeologists of the Bible believe that the town only had about 50 to 100 citizens. That's small, all right? Think about how many graduated with you in high school, and I would dare say that's smaller than most of your graduating classes. Everybody knew everybody, and uh, it was one of those kinds of towns, but it was very poor, kind of a depressed area in Galilee. Now, what's interesting about it is the series we have that we're bringing is called Expect the unexpected. And today, I'm going to be speaking to you about the unexpected experience. The unexpected experience. And somebody wisely once said, experience is what you get when you don't get what you expect. You know what I'm talking about? You expected something to go a certain way in your life. You expected some of you this Christmas that you were going to have that loved one at your Christmas table, and you're not getting that this year. That expectation has left you, and what you're left with is experience. You're left with something that you didn't plan or hope for. 
And I would dare say that's most of the Christmas story. If we look at the Christmas story, now some of you, you have really cool refrigerator magnets, you have maybe a a little nativity on your TV stand, and you, you get excited to show that off once a year. But mostly the view that we have as Christians of the Christmas story is very sanitized. It's not real. So what we're going to do today is we're going to unpackage the Christmas story and we're going to really get a glimpse, really get an idea of what the Christmas story means and what happened in the Christmas story. And to do that, we have to recognize that this is an experience. So let's see what happens here. Luke chapter 1 verse 26 and 27 says, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, there's a lot to unpackage here, but the first thing you need to know is they're heading to Nazareth. The angel is going to break the silence of God from heaven, and he's not going to go to a royal place. He's not going to go to a temple or a palace. He's going to go to Nazareth. Really? Nazareth. I picture, and this is in my mind, I picture like Gabriel... As he's getting his marching orders from God, he's like, okay, did you say, did you mean to say Nazareth? Like, you want, you want me to go there. Like, you don't want me to go somewhere else. You want me to go to Nazareth. He's like, yeah, talk to this girl. She's a a betrothed young lady. She's a virgin. Her name is Mary. Her husband's name is Joseph. And the angel of Gabriel does what he's told and he goes to Nazareth. Now, the first thing you need to realize and the first point is God shows up in unexpected places. God shows up in unexpected places, doesn't he? He doesn't show up when you think, where you think he would show up. Now, in your bulletin, there's an E that says God shows up in expected places, and that's not true because that would make this sermon really short because we're talking about the unexpected, okay? So it's actually unexpected in your bulletin. God shows up in unexpected places, and he does it all the time. Think about a time in your life. When God spoke to you, when God reached out and touched you in a way that you didn't think possible, it was usually during an unexpected time, wasn't it? You weren't expecting him. You weren't expecting to hear his voice that clearly. You weren't expecting to experience his presence there. You felt alone. You felt abandoned. And here God shows up in a big way, and he shows himself in unexpected places. That is the beginning of the Christmas story. He goes to Nazareth, this angel at Nazareth. Now, there's a lot to unpackage, and so we're going to do this quickly. We see that the angel is going to give a message to this young woman named Mary. Now, I want you to pretend with me, if you could, that you never heard the Christmas story. You don't know about Mary, Joseph. You don't know about the shepherds. You don't know about none of that. So let's pretend like we're hearing this for the first time. Let's let's start with Joseph. Joseph was a young man. Most pictures of Joseph, you see Joseph has like a beard. He's kind of sage looking. You'd go to him to ask advice. Maybe you'd go to him and ask how you could get a cheaper car insurance rate. Like this guy has all the answers, like in the pictures. But Joseph, most people conservatively believe, was only 14 to 16 years old. He was a kid. He was a young boy, young man. And the Bible says he was betrothed. He was engaged to be married And it was a legal engagement. It wasn't like they were just friends. They were just talking. They were hanging out. They were legally betrothed, meaning the families came together. They drew up a legal agreement. And this young man and this young woman were going to be married on a date that they agreed upon. And they weren't going to consummate the wedding until they had that date. So this is a very, very good situation. But Joseph was very poor. He's from Nazareth. He's a carpenter, hardworking, poor, but he loves God. Listen to me, ladies, if you're looking for a spouse. Listen to me, gentlemen, if you have a daughter or if you have a granddaughter and you have a daughter and you're trying to find the right guy for him, this is what I would suggest. I've had this advice in my mind for years. And now that I have a daughter, I believe this more than ever. The man that you're looking for should be able to hold on to two things, okay? Two things he should hold on to. Number one, he should be able to hold on to his Bible. And number two, he should be able to hold on to a job. If he has those two things going for him, you are ahead of the curve, 
okay? Now, if you get those things out of balance, you're headed in for trouble. If the guy really is good at holding on to a Bible, but not a job, he's going to be living in someone's basement. And that's not cool either, okay? If a guy's really good at holding on to a job, and he's, you know, really, really a go-getter, and he's aggressive, but he's not spiritual, you're going to run into problems there. You know, Pastor Mike always says, if you marry a child of the devil, you're always going to have a problem with your father-in-law, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, that was a good one. I like that. The Pastor Mikeism. I brought him right back for you there. So, but if you keep that in mind when you're looking for a suitor, that's Joseph. He wasn't rich, but he was a hard worker. He wasn't wealthy, but he knew God and he loved God. And the Bible describes him as a just man. So he's a good guy. Now, let's look here at how this unfolded. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It says, the angel appeared to Mary and said to her, do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. So this angel appears to this engaged virgin. Her name is Mary. Mary has her own story. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of an aside here. Most churches, we have problems with Mary. We really do. And churches either go one of two ways about Mary. We either make a lot of Mary and we make too much of her, or we don't mention her at all, okay? And some churches, they put her up on this pedestal as she is like to be worshipped and prayed to as a god. And some of you, maybe you grew up in this culture. But if you look at the Christmas story, you don't see that at all. In fact, the Bible says that Mary found favor with God. The translation in Greek means that God gave her grace. She didn't give grace. Some people say Mary bestows grace. Oh no, she received God's grace. She received God's favor. She didn't do anything to deserve that. God chose her and gave her grace. So we see that. But We don't want to dismiss her because she plays a really big role in the Christmas story. Now, most pictures of Mary look like this. looks like she's in her mid-30s. She's got it all together. Again, she has the same wisdom as Joseph, but that just simply isn't the story, folks. Mary, most believe, was between 12 and 14 years old. I want you to imagine that. Okay. Now, you see that picture of a woman that we have on the screen. That's like a 30-some-year-old Mary that's having the angel have a conversation. But the Mary that God chose to visit by the angel, she was young. We have one of our staff members, Bill Opperman. He has a daughter and she's 12. Her name's Annalise. Um, And Bill is one of our elders. That's a picture of a 12-year-old girl right there doing cool 12-year-old things. Beautiful girl, but she's 12 years old. She's 12 years old. Now, I want you to hear me on this. We would expect God to visit a woman who's engaged, a virgin who's engaged, maybe older, but God chooses to bring Jesus into existence through someone that most of us wouldn't trust the Wi-Fi password to, (laughs) all right? I mean, think about that for a moment. You wouldn't give her the key to your back door. God's like, I got a task for you. You found favor with me, and it's, this is how it's going to happen. So the angel appears to Mary, and gives her what we don't expect. Because God shows up in unexpected places, speaks to unexpected people. Look what it says here in verse 32 through 33. It says, he will be great. He will be called the son of the most high God. This is a term, the son of God most high. This is a term used in the Old Testament to describe the Messiah, God in the flesh here. It says, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is an unbelievable story. Now, Mary, because she's young, because she doesn't know a man, she's never been with a man, she's engaged. She goes, look, I don't, I don't know how this is going to work. I mean, I'm, I'm not been with a man. I'm betrothed. And she questions, and this is what the angel says in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. How do you like that? Isn't that cool? Nothing will be impossible with God. God wants this to happen. God means this to happen. And God is going to make it possible for this to happen. But it's going to be in an unexpected way. It's not going to be the way you think. It's not going to be to the rich lady that's been waiting for a husband in a different part of Jerusalem. No, this is coming to a poor woman who's engaged to a poor man who is now going to be the one who gives birth to the son 
of God. Unexpected. It's an unexpected experience. It's an unexpected experience. Now, what the angel says is you're going to give birth to Jesus. Mary rejoices. You're going to give birth to the Savior. Mary gets excited. You're going to have this wonderful, miraculous thing. That's great. You know what the angel doesn't say? Now, you have to go and talk to your boyfriend about this. Right? Oh, we don't put that in the Hallmark Christmas card, do we? Oh, no, we don't do that. We don't talk about that, but that's the conversation she has to have. You know what the angel doesn't say to her? Not that we see recorded. He doesn't talk about what her reputation is going to be like in Nazareth when people see her with the little baby bump. Now, it's cool on Instagram now, different culture. Back then, if you were pregnant out of wedlock or if you were engaged to be married, you know they could have stoned her. This is not something that is really could be rejoiced in a natural way. Mary is in a very difficult situation. Mary has just let go of every security that she's known. And that brings me to the next thing about the Christmas story and about our experiences is this. You have to let go of where you are to get where God wants to take you. Did you know that? Some of us, we put too much emphasis on the things of our lives. Too much emphasis on the place that we're at. Did you know that God may very well be wanting to move you into a new spiritual direction and you won't hear his voice because you won't let go of your position? You like that security. I believe that for some of you, 2019 is going to be a spiritually formative year that you've never even comprehended before. But in order to get to where God wants you to be, you have to be willing to take your hand off of your security, put it up to heaven and worship and say, I submit. Whatever your will is, I'll do it. Whatever you want from my life, no matter how it looks, even if it's not what I expect, I'm yours. I'll do it. That's what Mary did. She was excited. She went to have the conversation. She let go of her security, let go of the security she had in her relationship. And she went and she had that conversation with Joseph. Conversation went well, right? We know it went well, right? Not at all. It didn't go well at all. You say, well, yeah, it had to because Joseph and Mary were together. They were together, but the conversation that she had telling him about this didn't go well. How do I know? Look with me in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. It says, her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to an open shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So she explains, look, the Holy Spirit, you know, he did this. He made this happen. He did this to me. And Joseph said, oh, that's cute. We're not on Maury Povich, okay? This is not a lie detector time. You are a cheater. You broke my heart. And this is over. And the Bible says that in his quiet moments, he resolved that he was going to put her away. Because if he openly divorced her, she could have been executed. But he decides because he's a just person, because he loves God, he doesn't want to see harm to come to her, but he doesn't want to be with her either. That's pretty dark, isn't it? But I want you to put yourself in his position. What would you do? Come on, what would you do, guys? Is that story going to fly well for you? oh yeah, we've never been together and she's pregnant and I'm sure it's all going to work out. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that in history since, but it didn't work for Mary. It didn't work for Mary. So Joseph is disturbed. He's depressed. He's broken. He feels betrayed. But in the midst of that brokenness, God ministers to him. Look with me in Genesis, or, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. It says, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. How do you like that? God sent another angel. The angels were working overtime in Nazareth. Lots of angel stuff going on right there. All right. The Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And now the angel lets Joseph in on the plan. This is what he says. He says, she's going to bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? What's his name mean? Savior. Because you're going to call him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph is given this unbelievable relief knowing that Mary's telling the truth, but Joseph is giving an unbelievable burden of that he is going to be responsible for taking care of the woman that brings the Son of God, the Savior of the world, into existence. The most important event up to this moment in human history is Joseph is now 
a part of that, responsible for that. What a crazy story. What a crazy, remarkable story. God shows up in unexpected places. He appears to unexpected people. And while Joseph is in pain, mourning the loss of the betrayal of his future spouse and the pain associated with that, some of you know that all too well, what that's like to hear that your spouse has been unfaithful. I'm not naive. I've counseled tons of couples and gone through infidelity recovery more than I'd care to admit. And frankly, there is no other feeling like that feeling. And Joseph is feeling that, but he is relieved once he realizes a part of the plan, the bigger plan, the bigger purpose. And that's exactly how God works with our unexpected experiences. Take note, number three, eternal plans are forged in earthly pains. Eternal plans are forged in earthly pains, aren't, pains, aren't they? I mean, come on, we're bad at learning from God when we're doing well, aren't we? Think about it. When you're successful, when you're riding on the mountaintop, when you have all the things going for you, we're terrible students of God. We hardly hear his voice. We hardly make time to hear his voice. Oh, but we're in the, when we're in the midst of pain, we hear on a different frequency, don't we? We experience the plans of God in a different way and his presence becomes more meaningful to us than it ever is before because eternal plans are forged in earthly planes. Pains. I keep saying planes. Thinking about Nazareth. Maybe I'm thinking about an airplane. Who knows what I'm thinking about? It doesn't matter. Pains, earthly pains. Joseph is in the midst of that. And Paul kind of alludes to this in his letter to the Corinthians about these earthly pains and how they forge eternal plans. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light momentary affliction is preparing for us eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's your experience, folks. Whatever you're going through right now, it's painful. Whatever you are missing out this year, whatever you expected to happen that has now turned into a lost or dashed dream, God is forging something eternal that is going to stay with you for the rest of your life. He is giving you hope beyond this life that you can hold on to, that no matter what's going on, this momentary affliction carries with it a weight of eternity and glory. That's the Christmas story. That's exactly what's going on in the Christmas story. That's exactly what we see with Joseph and Mary. Now, the story goes from bad to worse when it comes to their situation because now the government issues a decree that they must all take part in a census. So Joseph and Mary have to travel from Nazareth all the way to another area called Bethlehem, which we're more familiar with Bethlehem than we are with Nazareth when it comes to the Christmas story. So they have to go. Now, I don't, I'm gonna, can I let you in on something personal, just personal about me? I have been pregnant approximately zero times, okay? <laughs> Never happened, okay? My wife has two children. We, you know, we had two babies, okay? So I was with her through the ordeal of being pregnant and through all of that, and the last thing that you would want to tell an eight-month-old or an eight-month pregnant woman is, hey, we're going to take a donkey trip across, across the desert. That is not a fun situation. I don't know about you guys, but I don't even like walking up the steps after I've had dessert. That, to me, is too much ambition. But now Joseph comes to his betrothed and says, hey, we are going to go to Naz or to uh, Bethlehem, thank you, Harry, for preaching my sermon. That was nice. That's great. Really makes you confident. When somebody's like, no, you're wrong. It's this word. Thank you. Where are you in the other parts of my life, Harry? We're going to go on a donkey trip to Bethlehem. It's going to be great. And I didn't get a, the upgraded donkey. I didn't get the Tesla donkey. I have the, you know, I have the, the Ford Pinto donkey. And you're going to feel every bump, Mary. You're going to feel every pain. So there they are. They're traipsing through the desert. They get to Bethlehem. And then the unthinkable happens. I'm sure you're shocked. Look with me in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. It's coming. It's over. This is it. And she gave birth right there. 
to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's stop right there for a moment. We gloss over this. Again, you have your little nativity set. You're like, oh, it looks so pretty. Got the perfect lighting. Okay, it's so crowded there because of the census that there's no room for them to stay at the inn. So the innkeeper says, hey, go stay in the stable, in the trough where the, the, the pigs and the livestock are kept. And most pictures of this, if you Google it, most people believe it was like a cave almost, this damp, dark cave. It's not the cute little well-lit with studio lighting, the, the, the little manger with the Serta sleep number scene, that the baby Jesus is on there. He's got, you know, the perfect, got a little binky and a rattle. You know, that was not this story. That was not. We sanitized that too much. Here, let me give you some, let me give you a little bit more practicality to this. How many of you have been to the zoo? Raise your hand if you've been to the zoo. Cafe, raise your hand, been to the zoo. Okay, how many of you have been to the zoo in like the dead of summer? Okay, I mean, I'm talking like July, right? Raise your hand, okay? Now, for whatever reason, my wife asked me, hey, we're all going to the zoo. It's July. Do you want to take the kids to the zoo? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, why do you want to do that? I'm like, because I hate myself. I hate my life. And I want to go to the zoo when it's 95 degrees. And trust me, folks, I've been to the zoo when it's 75 degrees. And I've been to the zoo when it's 95 degrees. And there's a big difference between going to the zoo and those 20 degrees. Amen? Preach. All right. So here we are at the zoo. And I want you to imagine the zoo smells like zoo. There is no other way to describe that smell. It's a cornucopia of badness. That's how the zoo smells. And at 95 degrees, it's enhanced. It's like zoo potpourri in your face. And here's the other crazy part about the zoo. You ready? They have people full time that get paid to detail all the cages and take care of all the animal stuff in the zoo. That that's all they do. And guess what? It still smells like zoo. It still stinks. Now, I want you to go backwards 2,000 years, and I want you to imagine the type of sanitation they had back then, and they stick this woman who's giving birth in a cave meant for livestock. I want you to imagine that for a moment. I want you to imagine how uncomfortable that is. They put the baby in a trough, the place that pigs come to eat. That's where the Lord Jesus is being born and laid in this area. It's unglamorous whatsoever. It's not expected. It's an experience. It's the way God wanted it. Jesus could have been born in a palace. Jesus could have been born in the temple, the most beautiful and picturesque place. But God chooses to bring him in the lowliest possible setting through the lowliest possible people because God does unexpected things. And he still does unexpected things. He still does unexpected things. So the story pans and gives, gives you a little meanwhile. I love this. This is so cool. So while she gives birth to this baby, and there's no room for them at the end, we have the shepherds. And this is the, the part that the, uh, the um, Charlie Brown Christmas story always recounts here. So we see here in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, in the same region where shepherds out in the field. So there are these shepherds. And you know what they're doing? They're doing shepherd stuff. They're just like tending to the sheep. They're telling shepherd jokes. They're playing shepherd games. I don't know. If you know what they do, tell me. But they're doing shepherd stuff. But the last thing they expected was that God was going to appear to them. But that's exactly what happens. It says, they were keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with with great fear. You think? Wouldn't you be? That would be the last thing you would expect to do when you're finishing up your shepherd shift and getting ready to punch out and go to your shepherd lodge. And you find that the angel of the Lord appears. You're like, oh, that's a different thing to happen today. But then the Bible says the glory of the Lord, the, the realm of heaven shone round about them, the glory of the Lord. We see it recorded in the Old Testament in the temple. We see it as, a, as the glory of the Lord ascended and guided the nation of Israel through the wilderness in a cloud, the glory of the Lord that dwelt within the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the of the glory of the Lord comes down upon them and they see the glory of the Lord and they are shook. I mean, imagine this time in history being split, the glory of the Lord descending and saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. God in the flesh is coming. The pronouncement of the angels, the singing, the worship, the biggest thing that you've ever could have imagined in a worship service is happening in this field, not to noblemen, not to princesses or princes or kings or queens, but God reveals himself 
to shepherds, to lowly shepherds that were doing their job in ordinary circumstances. God does something extraordinary. And he says, you got to check out what's going on. This angel says on the other side, this is what he says in Luke chapter two, verse 11. It says, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The pronouncement of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, his office, his messianic title, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one has come and is here. And this world will never be the same. This is a throwback from a verse hundreds of years earlier in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, behold, this shall be a a vision to you. This shall be a sign to you that a virgin shall bring forth a child and he shall be called Emmanuel. Now, all that we talked about, all that we talked about with the craziness of the Christmas story, all that we talked about with the awkward Joseph conversation, how poor Joseph and Mary are, how difficult her life is going to be now that she has this reputation, all of that, I believe, was wiped away the moment that Mary looked into the face of the Son of God. She beheld the face of God himself in the flesh. Emmanuel came to life in her mind. Your experiences are a lot like that. The pain, the unexpected. But the moment you see God's plan for your life, what he wants to do in your life, the four most important words will come to you. Emmanuel means four most important words. The four most important words that we can ever experience no matter what you're going through. The four most important words of Christmas. The reason why we decorate our houses and send Christmas cards. The reason why we celebrate and sing joy to the world. The reason it comes down to four words. God is with us. God is with us. The angels proclaimed, he is here. God is with us. God is here. God has visited. God is here. God has made a way. God has brought salvation to this world. God is with us. Now, that doesn't make every problem easy to bear. That doesn't give you a solution to something you're trying to figure out. But what it does do is it gives you the assurance to know that no matter what you're experiencing that you didn't expect, you are not alone. And God is not done working. He's not done working. I finished this sermon at the early part of the week. And the the hard part about when you write a sermon like this is sometimes God says, well, you haven't quite lived this enough recently. So the middle of the week, you saw, we, Pastor Mike and I have been out of state, but you saw the work that's being done on the new church campus, right? Like you see, they ripped all the trees down. They're putting a sock in. Uh, it looks like the Tootsie, I call it the Tootsie Roll, okay? It's like, it looks like a Tootsie Roll. Every time I see there, I'm like, I gotta pick up Tootsie Rolls on the way home from the grocery store. Anyway, so they've been putting that in and it's been going really well. Now, if you remember, the people that are installing that, we have a landscaper, but we have an, a company that is donating their excavation. It's a million dollars worth of work. It's a lot of work. They're donating it. It's a government organization, okay? So we have everything straightened out with the city. Well, on Thursday afternoon, I got a call from the organization. And they said there was another branch of the government that sent them a notice that they wanted them to be on a permit and they're threatening to shut the job down again. This is like the third time with this. It's a different part of the government. So they said, we can't do the work anymore. We can't do it. I said, you have to. I said, and I'm like, you know, I'm I'm trying to hold on to them. I'm like, it's it's a million dollars. It's a million, it's a million dollars. And they said, well, the government's telling us we're not allowed to do this. And you know, it's illegal that we do it. And we have all the permits. We paid for all the inspections, but the government is just doing this. So I... I didn't know what to do. So I hung up with the guy. We were going to have a meeting set for tomorrow. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I did a really wise executive leader type thing. Okay, this is what I did. I stood up from my desk and I left and I went for a really long walk. That's what I did. Okay, super, super deep leadership stuff here, folks. Okay, take notes. All right. So I didn't know what else to do. It, was, it wasn't a problem I could fix. It wasn't anything I do. So I got the name of an attorney that works for the government. And they said, here, you could call this attorney, but you have to have an attorney call her. And I'm like, 
By the time we get an attorney, by the time we hire one, by the time we go to court, by the time we do all this, it'll be a year. This will be a year, another year of waiting for this project to continue. And I just felt this burden and this pain, and I was all alone in this. And I was looking at this verse and God being with us and Emmanuel and the Christmas story and all of it. So I said, well, what if I call the attorney? And they said, well, you need an attorney to call an attorney. You're not an attorney. I'm like, well, what if I just tried? And they're like, well, she's not going to talk to you. So, of course, I tried. I called. And the lady's like, are you an attorney? I'm like, no. She's like, well, who are you? I'm like, I'm a pastor. She's like, we don't talk to pastors. I'm like, maybe you should try. I'm pretty pleasurable. I'm friendly. It won't be the worst thing that happens to you today, I don't think, you know. So I'm trying to get in her graces. And she was super graceful. She's like, look, it's an odd situation. And I said, this is all I'm going to say. I said, a lot of organizations that build... They have people above them and in, in, in organizations and boards and dioceses and churches like that. We don't have that. I said, that church is being built by our people, their sacrifice, their money, all that they've done. I said, that's donated money that is going into that project. And on top of that, that was a donated uh, excavation project but now, that's now going to add a million dollars to the church, to the church. We don't have anyone that can pay that bill. And she said, look, I don't know what I can do for you, but I'll try to look into it. So I put it on government clock. I figured I would hear from her probably by next Christmas. That's what I was thinking. She called back in 24 hours and she said, you know what? We got it all taken care of. Don't worry about it. And they sent me a formal letter. It's all good. Praise God. Amen. And I, I made a joke with her. I said, boy, oh boy, I don't know if you play Santa at your Christmas party, but you're doing a good job here. That's what I said. <laughs> Told you you'd like talking to me, but no, it was, it, was, um, it was a reminder. Now, I didn't expect that. I want this project to go smooth. I don't want to age 10 years every time I get a phone call. I don't want to have to have all these different things, but this is what I know. I know this. What I expect might not happen, but what I experience is fine as long as I keep those four words. God is with us. You need to put that as your banner for Christmas. The reason why we celebrate Christmas is not to exchange presents, but because we need to be reminded of the presence of God, the indwelling presence of God, the power of Jesus, and how he is still doing unexpected things in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, and we praise you for your grace, and we thank you for your love, and we thank you most of all for the presence of Jesus. We thank you for Emmanuel. God is with us. We claim that in our lives right now. Some of us are in a desperate place. Some of us are in a broken place. Let us only lift up our voice and cry out that you are with us. Let that be enough. Let that be our portion. Let that be our strength. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's somebody here and you would say you do not know where you would spend eternity. If you don't know that Jesus died for your sins and that he gave his life so that you could have eternal life. If that's nothing that you've done, if you've never trusted in Christ as your savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's the work that God is doing in your heart. I want you just to pray. My heavenly father, I know that I'm a sinner. But I believe as the Christmas story said that Jesus came to give his life for the sins of his people. And right now, I ask for forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on the cross, and I believe that Jesus rose again. And right now, I claim that victory in my life. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, I want you to write that on your connection card and let us know that you did. Now, Father, we thank you for the Christmas experience. We thank you that you do not give us what we expect, but what you give us has eternal weight beyond what we could comprehend. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.